subscribing and leaving comments. centuries, there was a man named Baron George Cuvier, who was one of the most prominent biologists of his time. Considering his place of influence in society, we would have expected that Cuvier would have done all he could to keep an open scientific mind while exploring the unknown. But instead, Cuvier, in the year 1812, made a public declaration that there were no more new species of large animals left to be discovered anywhere in the world. not a dramatization, but an actual account, as the events occurred to us on an investigation into the mystifying creature known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Not done in a lab studio, this footage was taken by the Amazing Horizons Research Organization, ranging across North America in pursuit of evidence that would shed new light on this rare, elusive, and stunning creature. In 1967, I saw the first live-action footage of the Bigfoot creature, photographed by Roger Patterson in California. What seemed incredible to me was that here we were putting a man on the moon when there was still so much unknown on our own planet. I began contacting the supposed experts in the field. I was joined by Ernest Montiel, a longtime friend. We formed the Amazing Horizons Company solely for the purpose of delving into the mysteries of the world. By most accounts, Bigfoot creature was believed to be an animal of the wild. So we knew that if we wanted to learn more about this creature, we had to find a man of the wilderness. And that man was Ida Mark. Bigfoot hunters from all over the country had come by my place since 1957 on to 1970. I'd be going out to check for Bigfoot tracks. They'd follow me. Or maybe I can get in on his find. But Tom Biscardi came up and said, hey, I'd like to join you. I said, no. And Tom kept coming by, and pretty soon, sure he's not out to see what I've found and swipe a picture or two. And by golly, I'm going to throw in with him. Ivan and his wife, Peggy, came to Northern California back in 1947. They found their utopia in the wilderness of Mount Shasta, Bigfoot country. 
I learned tracking from the shoulders of my father. He would carry me on his shoulders on the coon hunt. I'd sit on his shoulder and I would notice tracks and he'd show me. He said, Ivan, this is the track of a raccoon. In order to survive a depression like it is, we've got to catch this animal and get food on the table. So he'd take me down and say, look, here is the raccoon track. This raccoon has five toes. Now here's the cat track. This cat has four toes. He taught me why these animals had the four and five toes. And he also showed me how to trail them across muddy swamp, which is easy, and what to look for when they went across terrain that they would leave no tracks. They'd break twigs, or they might leave little smudge marks, or they'd even make the tracks in minute dust particles. When my father was teaching me, he had a pretty stern hand. He said, son, you better learn this if you want to survive. And even at that age, I realized that survival is the name of the game. My father's teaching gave me much knowledge. It was from him that I learned what to look for on the Bigfoot trail. When I found a bed, I knew that Bigfoot would defecate before going to sleep. So I looked for and found fecal matter. But one of the most important findings was how he would reach high up on a tree and leave his mark for others to see. In other words, this was his claim that this was Bigfoot territory. My wife, Peggy, goes with me on all of my expeditions into the wilderness, into the brown bear country, into the Bigfoot country, or if I'm sent out to trail down a mountain lion and catch it alive, a lot of times a mountain lion will be killing animals, and they say, hey, we don't want to kill this magnificent animal, let's remove him. So they send me out to catch this animal. What I do, I throw a rope around his neck, I pull him out of the tree, my wife grabs him by the tail, I tie him to the tree, I go around and take two more little ropes and tie his legs up, put a stick in his mouth and haul him hundred miles away, turn him loose again. So my wife goes with me on all these things. One time the grizzly bear got me down and chewed my leg up, and that woman still held her cool. Peggy was born in southern Arizona on a big cattle ranch. She spent all of her life in the desert country riding with her father, herding the desert longhorns and the Brahma cattle. When I go down into her part of the country, I'm afraid of those longhorn cattle because they run me up a tree every time. In April 1981, I got several reports of Bigfoot, Bigfoot tracks in the Mount Lassen area. I was out of movie film, and there's no way where I lived that I could buy movie film on the spur of the moment. So I loaded up my Nikon cameras and hit the trail. I was in the area several days. And on this one particular day, I was set, sitting waiting on uh, a water hole, which a Bigfoot or any animal has to come into a water hole, especially this time of the year. And I was just sitting there kind of relaxed. And all of a sudden, from out of the forest, here came this Bigfoot creature. And I could see that he was having the same problem I was because mosquitoes was all around him, same as they was on, all over my body. He stepped right out into the pool, he bent, reached over, he threw water all over himself, and then he shook the water away, and then I think he heard my Nikon camera click, because all of a sudden, he bounded off into the brush and disappeared, and that was the last I saw him. It was April 5th, 1981. Ivan called me. I assembled the Amazing Horizons crew, and we were off to Bigfoot country. All around the world they travel, searching distant lands, trying to find the creature. We made our camp about 30 miles from Ivan's ranch, where he had sighted the creature. Ivan explained he had received several phone calls from around the country on the same day he saw the creature, that others had also had sightings that day. All animals move in greater numbers during the full moon. If there's a Bigfoot sighting in Nome, Alaska, and there's one in California, one in Vermont, and one in Everglades of Florida, all at the same instant, then you know that there's more than one Bigfoot. I would say that there's a minimum on our continent alone of 1,200 of these things. Early the next day, we began searching for the prints this creature left behind. 
the area was perfect for the creature. Ivan believes the creature to be a vegetarian, so there are many theories that it is a meat eater. Bigfoot never eats any red-blooded meat. Bigfoot has been known to eat a few fish, but it's mainly berries, roots, and all kinds of vegetation. So many calls that I get and say, hey, come quick, Bigfoot just killed my cow. Go over there, a bear killed it. He's in my chicken coop. Well, there's so many things just in a chicken coop, a bobcat, a fox, a raccoon, but never have I found where Bigfoot eats any red meat. Ivan has domesticated wolves for hunting purposes. Ivan explained that the wolves consider Bigfoot a friendly creature by the way they roll in the scent of the footprints. This is a sign that the scent belongs to a friendly wilderness creature. We gathered as many casts of the prints as we could, noting the long stride of the creature as well as their resemblance to flat-footed humans. But considering the depth to which each print depresses the earth, the foot going far deeper into the ground than any human print, I am continually amazed. Prints that range anywhere from 12 inches to 21 inches in length and 4 to 8 inches wide, far larger than that of any living creature known to exist in North America. Something is making these giant human-like footprints. This something makes them, and Ivan has proved it can be caught in the act. It is extremely difficult and rare, but not impossible. We are determined to continue our search until we can prove to the world that there is a creature unknown to man who has a unique knowledge of survival to have eluded man for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Tom set up our crude but efficient listening device with the hopes of uh, recording some live action sound of Bigfoot, while the rest of our search party scanned the area for a possible sight. Ivan was no bear tracker. Tom was a man of dreams. And Ernie came along and I wrote the songs about a creature that few's ever seen. Monsters, missing mysteries, legend tales and facts. It brought us all together and it's a reason for that. Up in North California, where the redwoods reach the skies. Three men with a gold and a pack that they hold and a promise till the day that they die. Answers to the questions no one's found before. Driving determination, the only key they had to unlock the door. Monster facing mysteries, legend, tales, and facts. Early miners throughout the Pacific coast of America and Canada often had encounters with hairy creatures or wild men. In 1904 in Cottage Grove, Oregon, it was reported in a newspaper there that many of the miners avow that the wild man is a reality. They have seen him. They say he is something after the fashion of a gorilla and unlike anything else, either in appearance or action. He is about seven feet high, has broad hands and feet, and his body is covered by a prolific growth of hair. In short, he looks like the very devil. And what can we make of additional writings based on pre-Christian European stories in which Saxon tribes were known for a ritual called chasing the wild man out of the bush or fetching the wild man out of the wood? A supposedly mock ceremony based on a real live wild man who was known to inhabit the wilderness areas of the land. We can see that this picture could have easily appeared in the Lane County Leader in Cottage Grove, Oregon, hundreds of years later, under the same name, Wild Man. We even came upon writings of a noted Russian scientist, Dr. Boris Porshnev, where he reported that Chinese Mongols used to hunt creatures of the same description as the Wild Man, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, and the like, through Asia, hunting them on a wide scale and even in some cases capturing them, taming them, and using them for domestic purposes. Some records go as far as reporting ancient oriental practices of hunting these poor half-human to slaughter them for wild man medicine. We had gotten all we could from this part of our search here in the Mount Shasta area. Ivan was anxious for us to meet with an Indian named Whitebird who would have some fascinating stories to tell us about his experience with the creature.
White Bird is an artist from the Mugion Rim country of Arizona. He was raised by the Apache Indians. I used to visit an old Indian when I was a child. His name was Henry Evans. He was 110 when he died. Henry used to tell me about the creature. In Arizona, when I was about eight or nine, I actually saw the creature up on the Tonto Rim. I was alone. At first, I didn't know what it was. Finally, I put two and two together and figured what has been will be again. Old Henry Evans was already dead. I could never tell Henry I finally saw him. I couldn't talk to many others about it. A lot of the people were afraid of him. Some of the old timers, they weren't afraid because they knew what he represented. He's more of a god, I guess you'd say. Henry told me stories about the fire pit. Bigfoot used to inhabit the Tonto Rim country of Arizona. Lots of Indians lived there in small groups and fell prey to warring tribes. And Bigfoot would walk along the creek bank. When the warriors got ready to attack the peaceful natives, Bigfoot would start a fire. He'd be standing by a rock, and the dang rock would catch on fire. And it would just burn and burn and keep getting higher and higher until the renegades left. A lot of the old Indians felt he actually had hypnotic powers. You see, he protected those people. That's the way he did it. He always tried to keep the hostilities down between tribes. I never did go trailing the critter down. It wasn't that I was afraid. I just didn't have any special gift for tracking, like old Ivan here. In June 1981, my wife Peggy and I was out searching for Bigfoot tracks in Northern California. As we walked across the clearing, carrying a camera in my uh, right hand and a rifle over my shoulder, my wife carried a Bolex movie camera, just the like one I was carrying. And all of a sudden, we heard a gunning sound coming from out of the brush. I told my wife, here, hold this camera because I think we have the bear coming. When I first saw the beast charging at me out of the brush like a grizzly bear, my first impulse was to shoot in self-defense. My wife photographed the entire incident until her camera ran out of film. Then while she switched cameras, the beast charged at me one more time and I shot. And then it went down. As we run around so we get a better look at the creature, I had to shoot one more time to discourage because it looked right straight at us and I did not want to kill it thing and as I watched it drag off into the brush I did not fire anymore but then as the creature surprisingly raised up and began racing off through the timber I fired three more shots in this close proximity just to scare the thing away then my wife spotted the creature uh, turned to look at us and then went over the hill I just stood there, my wife said, what are we going to do? I said, let's get out here, let's run. Because I don't want this thing coming back. I don't want to have to kill this creature. So immediately, we run as fast as we could back to where we had dropped a lot of our camping gear, back to our pickup, and went home. I think we was all born with the ability to trail down animals. We had to, or we wouldn't be here today. Our forefathers would not have survived. You take track of one animal, then you take a track of another animal of the same species, walk them along side by side, and I'll tell you which one's which. And when I trail the animal down, the one that I want, it'll be the one I started on. They may cross another pathway of seven or eight different animals of the same species, but I'll come up with the right one, because a track to me is as different as faces of people. You walk down the street, you see people's faces, you recognize them. Well, I'm looked at so many tracks in my lifetime that each individual animal track has a, its own character, its own shape, and its own definition. Ivan described Manhattan as a different kind of wilderness. When he told us he imagined the Bigfoot creature like King Kong perched on top of the Empire State Building, we figured it was time to get him out of the city. Our trip to New York was planned specifically around a Dr. Gary Levine, whose study of the creature appeared as an article in Globe National Magazine. We were also anxious to authenticate some recent reports of sightings in that area. Dr. Levine's research was in the realm of defining the Bigfoot creature as a psychic phenomenon. First of all, what is it? 
It's not an animal that can be classified. Animals have to be classified. Is it a mammal, an amphibian? One of the reasons we assume the psychic theory is that it has never been caught. We don't have anything more to go on except to say that it's not an evolutionary product. There is no such thing as the missing link. That's a myth. Those who have had contact with him, this contact is psychic, on the most part. Now, there are a few cases where, of course, the research is very difficult to get at, where some people who have seen it may not be psychic. The psychic phenomena thing about Bigfoot is not realistic, because out in the mountains, everything is real. Everything seems to have a reason. Now, I believe that a lot of people do have visions like this, but I think it's maybe caused from something they eat, maybe a, a little indigestion or something like that. Though Dr. Levine believes this creature to be a psychic phenomenon, he did direct us to a family in Kinderhook, New York, where there had been recent sightings of the creature. I heard a wailing cry, almost like a human sound. Then I saw it. Out here, right here, huge black, black fur. It curled up and laid down on the ground right here. My brother sometimes sleeps up in his treehouse up there. One night we heard him calling for help. He was frightened to death by the cries of this creature. I came running out. In a small town in upstate New York on August 30th, 1976, there were reports of a huge ape as reported to the local police, the New York State Police, and a Washington County Deputy Sheriff who searched the area, but were only able to spot the creature from a distance. The creature has been widely described by both police officials and civilians as between seven and eight feet tall, very hairy, having red eyes, as weighing between 300 and 400 pounds. Police Sergeant Murdoch said, I'm not saying this is a monster or anything else, but there is something out there, and it's no animal that belongs in the northern part of this state. A few of the people who gathered with us at the Hollandex were there to tell the family they thought it was all a hoax. This is why so many sightings go unreported, because of skeptics who make it difficult for people to come forth with their stories. No one wants to be called crazy by their neighbors. And no neighbor wants to live next door to someone who talks crazy. Many people all over the world, in fact, think that Bigfoot is entirely a hoax. Well, <laughs> I've got to say I can't blame them because I thought he was hoax. The first few times somebody come and said, hey, you want to chase a big old hairy looking thing over the mountain? I said, no, I don't want no part of that thing. And I kind of laughed. But a lot of people think that he is a hoax for the simple reason they don't know anything about this kind of thing, nor do they know about the wilderness and how an animal like this couldn't fit in the wilderness without being detected any more than he is. So they say, well, he is a hoax and that's the way it is. Looking back on yesterday Because you hadn't seen sun You tend to disbelieve Though you've never known death When someone dies you grieve Though you've never seen the Lord There's ones that worship him each day 20% of the people that sees a picture of Bigfoot say, look at this picture. Oh my goodness, the little hair on his head that's out of place. And look down here, I bet that's a wrinkle back of his knee in his monkey suit. Then I immediately walk over to one of my bear pictures and say, look at this. What's this picture? Why, that's a bear. I say, are you sure? Why, certainly. I know bear when I see him. I said, that's right, you sure do. But now look at this picture close. You see down here on the side of this bear where his skin is wrinkled? Yes. And then you see over here the foot that's on the ground that's made flat. That looks like it's out of proportion. Do you reckon this is a mounted bear? And then he looked close. He started scrutinizing the picture. I said, that's my point. Let's take it back to the Bigfoot creature now. You look at him and you don't have any idea what he looks like. So you can find fault. It just all boils down to if you know, then you don't look for flaws. 
Now there is always, as Ivan says, hoaxes, produced by perhaps prankster youngsters with access to high school shop classes and plywood. But consider this. What if the incidents that we are aware of are only a small fraction of what is really out there? Our astonishment, indeed dismay, that a society such as ours, which has the appearance of being one so deeply concerned with self-improvement and self-understanding, then why have we not considered this phenomenon of nature worthy of study? If, as our research supports, this creature has been reported in historical references from pre-Christian Europe to present-day North America, what is it that causes us to avoid, worse still, pervert and commercialize this subject into monster movies and the like? Is it that we are afraid of looking at something that reminds us of our possible origins? Is it the fear of Darwin's theory of evolution? Or simply the frightened scientific egos who, like Baron Cuvier back in 1812, have proclaimed their findings, and now nature must conform to their edicts? To save science the painful embarrassment of being proved wrong? Perhaps we have placed undue pressure on a select group of people who feel they can only maintain our respect and their credibility by holding firm to being right, even at the cost of being completely wrong. At Castleton State College, we were invited to the house of Dr. Warren Cook, an ethno-historian and professor of anthropology and history. I was born in the Pacific Northwest, and of course this influences how I look at the world. My specialty is Native American culture history. And for years I've been aware that every Indian tribe in the Pacific Northwest has various names for a hairy man-like creature wandering around in the woods. It's pretty much if they, as if they took the attitude that, well, someday the white man will wake up and realize that there is such a creature out there in the woods. Historical references to hairy hominids in North America date from 1688. Jose Mariano Mocinho, a scientist accompanying a Spanish expedition to Nootka Sound in 1792, recorded Indian beliefs about a monstrous man-like creature covered with stiff black bristles and extremely long arms. In 1811, in the Canadian Rockies, famed explorer David Thompson spotted gigantic tracks of a similar creature. In British Columbia, 1835, a party of Indians had with them a hairy, hominid, quote, a hideous-looking monster, said to be of the feminine gender, with sledgehammer fists and enormous feet. In 1840, the Reverend Elkena Walker reported the Spokane Indians' belief in a race of nocturnal giants that whistled, had a most intolerable smell, and made tracks a foot and a half long. In British Columbia in 1884, an adolescent Sasquatch was captured, caged, and shipped eastward by train. How do you account for all these sightings all over the world, known by different names and all? Well, of course, the gorilla wasn't really recognized as a species until well into the present century, and they are quite numerous. How is it they could escape documentation for so long? I don't find it surprising that this creature, if it is as intelligent as it seems to be, that it could escape efforts at capture. I know that right here in Vermont, the ease with which a bull moose can move and be reported 50 miles away and then all of a sudden disappear and not be seen in between there and the point where it turns up four days later. This photograph was taken during a construction project here in Vermont. If you look close, at the top is a black shape that, when enlarged, looks like a Bigfoot. There is no upturned stump at that spot. A huge, hairy, ape-like creature was sighted in that very area at about the same time. The difference in the hair length can be attributed to the fact that this picture was taken in the fall, whereas the others from California were in the spring, when all wild animals have shed their winter coats. After collaborating with Ted Pratt and Dr. Cook, and having received a letter of verification from Dr. Cook here in Vermont, and one from Dr. Levine earlier on in New York authenticating the photographs that we showed them, we were quite satisfied. It is only this kind of collaborative research that can serve to further our understanding of the unknown. In Florida, a news article was published on January 17, 1976. Will the skunk ape strike this year? 12-year-old Ronnie Stevens was awakened one night by the sounds of his ducks thrashing about in their pen. When he went outside, there stood a six-foot-tall, dark, hairy, ape-like creature. The elusive creature vanished. 
But both Deputy Timothy Egan and Corporal Martin Smithson of the Sheriff's Department agreed that something had been in the area. Two other accounts were reported the previous week. The Bigfoot creature in Florida is called Skunky. For the last 20 years, stories have been coming out of the Everglades about this creature. The only thing to do is go down and see if any of these things was authentic. With all the publicity in recent years, we found it rather easy to locate some people who could guide us to the different areas where sightings had occurred. A young man named Vinny Zinglo served as our best source of information. He told us, however, that even though there had been a great deal of publicity, people reporting numerous sightings, there still was no sign that this creature was taken seriously. Vinnie went on to tell us about the state of Washington, Skamania County, where the Board of County Commissioners had actually taken steps to protect the creature. Therefore, be it resolved that any premeditated, willful, and wanton slaying of any such creature shall be deemed a felony punishable by a fine not to exceed $10,000 and or imprisonment in the county jail for a period not to exceed five years. Vinnie told us the next person we should speak with was an Indian man named Bobby Tiger, one of the most respected wilderness experts of the Everglades. Bobby Tiger, wildlife man and alligator wrestler. We talked to Bobby Tiger about the Bigfoot creature. And Bobby said, sure, our people has told about this creature ever since we have any recollection of time. Our old people sat around and tell stories at night. Old gator laying on the edge of the swamp, laying there waiting on you. Gator sways a grin. Cause you ain't wearing no shoes, ain't wearing no shoes. What you doing down by the bayou, walking with that old cane pole? Should be in school, I bet you're heading for the fishing hole. But what you might have told you, boy? No, you're breaking all the rules. Out in the swamp, old man Gator, he's awaiting the you. Walking through the high glades, I didn't see. Old man Gator, he's awaiting on me. Got me by the foot, got and I was a fool. I should have listened to mom and stayed in school. Hey, Mr. Gator, what you doing? Wrapped right around the side of this tree. This picture here was taken this spring in Northern California. And here's one taken by a man in Vermont just two months ago. They didn't know what it was at the time until they magnified the dot in the photo. Yes, you can see it through there, what we call skunk ape. There are many who have seen the creature, but they don't want to talk about it. It seems you have much knowledge of this creature, but still we know very little. As with my alligators, I know much, but very little. But you know his patterns enough to have captured him. Bigfoot seems to set no pattern. If we could learn this creature's patterns, what we could learn about survival, my friend. As we came to see, Bobby certainly knows the patterns of the alligators. This could be the only way Bobby could work with them as he does. He knows that the secret behind the power of the gator's jaws lies in the muscles used to snap shut. By understanding that the muscles used for opening its jaws are fairly weak, the danger is lessened when he places the gator's jaws under his neck. Of course, this is easy for us to say, sitting safely outside the arena. What is important is to see that his courage comes from his knowledge of the animal's habits and patterns. No, you're breaking all the rules. Yeah, I'm in the swamp, when gator, he's a waiting on you. He's a waiting on you, and he can't. Okay. Old man gator on the edge of the swamp, he's a laying there waiting on you. Gator sways a grin. Cause you ain't a wearing no shoes, ain't wearing no shoes, he's a waiting on you as a grin. You see? <laughs> Many years ago, before the population built so much around them, the skunk ape creatures would come. We believe you see here. Look who's going to see it. And if he does, He's a lucky hunter.
Bobby suggested we go out into the Everglades swamp areas, that this is where the skunk ape was most often sighted. Our guide related countless stories of the sightings. He shared some thoughts on where he felt this creature came from. It is known that the creature had been from a tribe of Indians in Asia, born with a frightening physical appearance. These outcasts were driven into the wild. We feared his strength would be used against our people. Again, I was picking up this great sense of fear from Indian tribes. I remembered an older legend that I had come across about the Mongols of Asia, that they had actually been known to train these ape-like creatures for use in warfare against their Indian rivals. Could this be an explanation of why so many Indian tribes to this day express this great fear of the creature? people in Florida, we believe that the skunk ape is a subspecies of big truck. The body is a little heavier, more like a heavyweight wrestler. While the big truck of the Pacific Northwest is more like a marathon run. From walking the high mountains, he is a much slimmer, slimmer sail. While deeply engrossed in our search in the Everglades, our office received word of recent sightings in the Louisiana Bayou country. So off we went. By contacting a woman named Edith Vicnair, the editor of the Sun newspaper in Laplace, Louisiana, we had, within a few hours, not only the local people aware of our arrival and purpose, but we had the local sheriff acting as our host. After speaking with the people who had seen a creature whose description, once again, was almost identical to that of the sightings all over the country, we went out to determine whether the area was right for this creature's needs. And it was. There was an abundance of water, vegetation, and sheltering forest land. One of the people who had sighted the creature was a man named Emmett Perilou, from one of the oldest Louisiana families. In fact, this area is known as Perilou Land. Emmett was anxious to show us where the tracks had been last found. It was a heavily wooded spot with hanging grapevines and dense undergrowth. The prints were found in the mud where the creature had come out of the thicket and into an open field, down into a five-acre patch of turnips. Evidence showed that the creature had eaten of the vegetables, then continued on his way back into the protection of the woods. One of the people who accompanied us into Paralu land was a man named Robert Fabian, a geologist and expert on the Bayou country. He invited us to go into the swamps with him. After hearing about what was out there in the swamps, we decided this was something we would leave to Ivan and Robert. I had to go alone because the Bayou country is treacherous. You have alligators, you have snakes, you have quicksand and all kind of hazards out there, and Fabian was a man of the bio country. So Fabian and I made the trip alone, and we found that this was really another paradise for Bigfoot. I think you can find a paradise like this almost any state in the Union, because nature has fixed it this way. He gives us something for everybody in every state. The animals and the birds, once they get acquainted with us, they will become active again. Snakes are kind of sluggish this time of year. We shouldn't find any hanging in the foliage above our heads, but be careful not to step on one when we leave the boat. We're friends bigger than a giant man Things out there no one understands Yeah, funny looking tracks called in Paraloo land Some folks say it looks like some joke Might be a Sasquatch and I don't know Whatever it is, don't look be around Looking for tracks in that St. John ground 
Looking for something no more will be found At first, there were stories that someone was living out there in the swamp, some hermit, a trapper, but uh, then about four years ago, a drought hit the glade land. A grass fire swept through, chasing out all living things. Animals all kinds starting past the firefighters, running for their lives. Well, I was there helping, dousing for my boat. We saw not only myself, but others too. We saw a handful, maybe six creatures, fleeing those scorching flames. I put it in the zoo People keep looking even though they're wrong Them great big tracks out there in St. John Funny old tracks across the valley of the line But we're better than a giant man Things out there no one understands Patrick Corey, one of my former students, took this photograph at a lamasery near the base of Mount Everest in Nepal, at the, the lamasery of Pang Boche, and it shows a domed skull cap. Mr. Corey was given the opportunity to examine it inside and out, and what looks like an artificial seam is natural, a product of the development of, uh, of the creature itself. This is a strong uh, factor to take into account when passing judgment on the what is uh, what seems in uh, Ivan Marx's photographs to be a peaked uh, skull. If anyone is really interested in charting the course of Bigfoot, I believe you can take a look at our map of Tibet, and then you take a look at the mountain range. The mountain range will go straight from Tibet up south of the Mongolian Plateau, straight northeast on up towards Alaska and it ends right at the little ice bridge area where all the American Indians probably originated from, come across from Mongolia and Siberia and that part of the country. Well, then this complete mountain range is only 25 miles then from the start of the Brooks Range. Then the Brooks Range goes across the top of Alaska, on down through the Yukon Territory, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and down into California. The Honey Island creature reminded us again that the likelihood of there being many species that have yet to be categorized and recognized by the scientific community was as much a mystery as it had been to the scientists back in 1812 when that Cuvier fellow announced there were no new species to be discovered. Almost all animals have a routine. The pattern that they set in their daily lifestyle a wolf has a pattern, a cougar has a pattern, and a bear especially has a pattern. A human is really in the same category. Because when a human does something wrong, the law enforcement officer looks at him and says, hey, let's see if he fits in the pattern. Then we know pretty well who done it. Well, the Bigfoot creature is a little different. That is the reason I'd say that this thing has never been captured. And this is the reason that it's taken me since 1951 to really come up on a kind of a logical conclusion of where I might find this thing at a certain time of year. My sister the moon at night takes its place My wish for you, no matter who you be Is to share my gifts and live in harmony Drink from my streams, my water of life You rest upon my soft cool lands at night There's an area in Alaska that they call Windy Mountain, 
And there's one trapper up there that I know of that when he first saw this creature, he told everybody in the village, he says, we must not trap on Windy Mountain because there's a white ghost. You can't trap on Windy Mountain because the white ghost travels there. Some say that it's a yeti. It's the white color of its hair. Just like the dinosaurs, he should have died off long ago. But the will survive is kept him alive in Alaska's frozen snows. Tales around the campfire, handed down from father to son. Tell of the ghost of Windy Mountain and all the things he's done. He's a guardian of the creature. My wife and I have struck up a meaningful relationship with the natives of Alaska because they call us the friends of Bigfoot. People in Alaska tell me Bigfoot is a creature that walks without a shadow. It is said that Bigfoot is afraid of his shadow. But we believe in our village, if Bigfoot can see his shadow, it is too light to walk because people with guns can see him. People must learn to leave him alone, as we do. And maybe someday he can enjoy the warm Arctic sun and learn to live with his shadow. We hope you will tell the people to the south. And if they learn this, Bigfoot will be free and our village will be happy. If any of the Alaskan people think that they have offended Bigfoot, they just real saddened. I know of several occasions where they've come upon a Bigfoot track that has crossed their territory. They'll walk up to the track, they'll look at it, say, oh, Bigfoot has sent me warning. So what they'll do then, if they have a couple of rifle shells in their pocket or a pocket knife, split everything they have down the middle, they'll leave half of it on the ground for Bigfoot as a symbol that we have heeded your warning and we will return to our village. The Eskimo people of Alaska claim that they have plenty of knowledge where Bigfoot takes his own dad and drops the bodies into the crevices of the glacier. Then the glacial action will grind the body to bits. The Eskimo people claim that the Bigfoot really take care of their dead. Do you ever learn these special gifts must be returned? I must take you, I must reclaim, you shall return where you came, over I am the earth, I am your home. Some of my treks into the Arctic, I talked to a lot of the old time miners. In fact, I interviewed a fellow by the name of Yukon Blackie in Dawson City, Yukon Territory. These things buzz around in great numbers. They'd come on top of the mountain and sit around and watch everybody down below. The bear was there, the wolf was there, and the caribou was there. And so was Bushman. Of course, you know we call him Bushman, your Bigfoot creature. Along towards 1905, maybe 1910, when the riverboats brought many, many people into Alaska, these things seemed to disappear. If the population gets that thick, we're going to revert back to the days like the dinosaur, when they eat up everything on Earth and wound up in a big pool of oil down underneath the terrain. So Bigfoot, if he should invent a vehicle, then this guy might be driving around with our own petrol. For years, stories have been told about the swimming capabilities of Bigfoot. It is said he can swim more than a mile underwater. So the Amazing Horizons group decided to check out one of the lakes where creature sightings occur the most frequently. Ivan took all his camp gear and flew out to see what he could find. They searched the lake shore to no avail as Ivan listened to the pilot tell about an old sourdough living in the area. He did not know the sourdough's correct name. The pilot said they simply called him Moose because of his size and the way he survived living all alone out there in the Alaskan bush country. The story was so intriguing, Ivan decided to stop at Moose's camp and spend a few days interviewing him. Much to Ivan's surprise, after taking all his gear off the plane and instructing the pilot to leave, old Moose was nowhere to be found. 
The sun never dips completely below the horizon during the summer months, so Ivan used the twilight hours to set up camp. The next day, Ivan started out to find the wilderness hermit. He could tell that Moose must have been catching fish for the long winter months ahead by the fishing equipment that was in the tent. But the first day, no sourdough could be located. That night, Ivan had a plan. He would not spend so much time waiting around camp. Tomorrow, he would track the woodsman to his lair. Moose didn't appear too friendly at first, but when asked about Bigfoot and the legend of the lake, he began to accept Ivan's intrusion. He said the legend of the lake was quite confusing. The legend was about two creatures, Bigfoot and the lake monster. This Indian girl and her new husband went to the lake to prepare fish for winter, but the young brave made the mistake of painting his canoe blood red. Everyone has heard about the hair-covered half-whale, half-alligator that lives in the lake. Some believe it is a landlocked prehistoric monster that was cut off from the ocean by an earthquake or something. Probably didn't evolve any further because of the frigid cold water. The Indian girl told that her husband must have seen a movement in the water. And as he leaned over the canoe to get a better look, the water reflected the canoe's red color back into his face. And the monster swooped up and devoured him. The girl would not leave the lake. And one day, the monster came ashore and got her. Moose thought the legend to be a myth until he found the tracks of a heavy creature in the exact area where the couple had disappeared. So he fashioned a giant treble fish hook to be tied to a 50-gallon drum with airplane cables. The drum would act as a giant fish bobber. Then he could locate and dispose of the evil critter. Moose towed it out into the lake where he could put a sack of caribou entrails on it for bait. Moose made sure not to have any red paint on the canoe, but as he planted the bait, he remembered his red shirt. I don't mind telling you, he said. I didn't waste any time getting back on dry land. Moose took his canoe out of the lake and went back to the river where fishing was not so hazardous. He fired up his smoke rack and took care of the salmon. There was no way he could put his canoe back in the water again as long as he had that red shirt on his back. He walked back to the lake to check on his giant fishing tackle. But it was gone. The thing had taken it all, hook, line, and sinker. The story Moose gave Ivan about the lake monster was quite convincing. So he took old Moose's advice and conducted his Bigfoot search on the upper reaches of the salmon stream where the salmon lay dead after spawning. According to Moose, Bigfoot tracks were most often found there. Why the salmon all die after spawning is still a mystery. But because of this, their offspring and many other species are able to feed off the dead carcasses before going downstream and out into the ocean. Soon a blanket of ice will cover the salmon carcasses encasing them in nature's own deep freeze where they await being excavated and devoured by the weary winter traveler. Tales are told around Arctic fish camps how Bigfoot will not kill for food, but will eat the flesh of salmon that have died of natural causes. Ivan found this to be true because every once in a while he found where a salmon had been picked up and carried away by the creature. The abundance of salmon may be reason enough for Bigfoot to inhabit the Arctic. The Alaskan brown bear is ever present along the remote salmon streams, and he must not be ignored. Ivan lost both of his supply tents before he decided to move back to the main Amazing Horizons camp. The bear made Bigfoot tracking almost impossible along the lower salmon streams during spawning season. Ivan joined the rest of the crew in the search for bones around the melting glaciers. The warm Arctic sun circling around the sky bathed the ice pack with its heat almost constantly during this time of year. As small trickles of water carved away at the lower reaches of each glacier, 
the ice cracked and broke apart. In so doing, any animal lying encased in the tomb of ice would once again be deposited back into the world in which it had once lived. The ice search grew monotonous for Ivan, so he left camp and headed down the glacial stream in search of a living creature. The wilderness is Ivan's home. The jigsaw puzzle of life he confronts on the trail may always be a mystery to mankind. But each individual animal inhabiting the mountainous regions of this planet plays his own important role in balancing nature. But what about Bigfoot? Ivan knows that he, like almost all other warm-blooded animals, must have played an important part in the environment from which he came. For today, his trail entwines in and out of the feeding grounds used by the other animal species sharing in the Earth's great bounties. To an old-time bear tracker, Bigfoot's trail finally begins to make sense. Like all other creatures, he must have water and food. If Ivan's theory is correct, and the creature is basically a vegetarian, then he must follow nature's own irrigation system, namely the streams and rivers, because this is where food grows most abundantly. The small stream Ivan was following joined a river some miles below, and there he crossed the trail of Tundra Lily, a woman reaping her harvest from the lush land on which she lived. Her interpretation of Bigfoot was that he was no different from any other living creature, including herself. He, of all things, is a survivalist in the most renowned sense of the word. I learned much from Bigfoot, she noted, just by watching his tracks in the snow. I learned to survive these long Arctic winters. I, however, gather my supplies ahead of time and store them. But Bigfoot cannot do this because he is afraid of man and his greedy ways. Greedy people in my past life is the reason I moved to the Arctic. Every living being on this green earth was born to inherit his share of the good life. But how many of us have the fortitude to pursue what this land has to offer, as do tundra lily, sourdough moose, and the creatures that surround them? The only problem tundra lily seems to have is old sourdough moose who lives downstream. One part of nature's puzzle that astounded Ivan was the fact that the Arctic salmon grew large canine-like teeth at spawning time. The salmon does not eat while spawning. Could it be for self-defense only? This earth we live on has many strange secrets, but there is one thing for certain. She provides food in abundance for all wise enough to seek it out. But what about the bear? He is the largest living carnivore and must have massive amounts of food to survive. I guess nature took this into consideration when she gave the bear the ability to hibernate during the winter months when food is scarce. Here in the Arctic, Bigfoot and the grizzly seem to feed alongside each other without any sign of physical encounter, even though bear have been known to kill each other. Coexistence of a different kind must prevail. Ivan has probably spent more time tracking bear than any man alive but he knows the bear's temperament and avoids contact whenever possible. Some of Ivan's friends have been killed by the grizzly. Almost overnight, the winter winds began to blow, warning Ivan it was time to return to base camp and prepare for our exodus from the Alaskan tundra. The snow line was lowering when Ivan climbed to a higher elevation to call base camp on his walkie-talkie. I will never forget Ivan's words coming in over the radio. Like a ghost in the Arctic, Bigfoot has left us with little to show for our summer's work. But every little piece of information we gather will soon place Bigfoot's piece of nature's puzzle in its rightful place. So we of the Amazing Horizons expedition leave the land of the midnight sun, but our trip was not a total failure. The ice had revealed some of its bounty to us. A skull, probably that of a mastodon, still had particles of flesh intact and we were fortunate enough to smell the odor of the prehistoric creature hundreds of centuries old. The second bone was a leg bone, but it was much older than the mastodon skull. It was found in an altogether different area. Bones and a strip of film, not much, but enough for us to want to return. We will go back to the ice, and maybe next year, the remainder of the skeleton that joined our leg bone will 
be free of its icy bondage. We're all happy to hear that Moose and Tundra Lily had settled their differences and can now live happily ever after in their vast Arctic paradise. We received word from the university near Ivan's Ranch in Bernie, California, that a young woman, an anthropology student, had sighted the creature near her home in Cow Creek Canyon, not more than 35 miles from Ivan's place. We were anxious to get back home because the winter months were setting in, and it was rapidly becoming one of the worst winters ever, so this was more than we could have hoped for. We went directly to the home of the student, Judy Ramirez. Boy, this is fantastic country. Bigfoot critters will get over there in a hurry. My gosh. Hey, Tom. Look. This mountain is something else for that creature. Yeah, you've got berries, you've got uh, acorns, everything in the world. It's just like that Bluff Creek country. Yeah. Right. That's right. Well, there's caves up here all the way through to Alaskan Mountain and clear over to Shasta. So it's Oh, this is perfect country. They got plenty of water, plenty of food, so it's just fantastic. Now, Judy, why don't you tell us just exactly what happened that night? Okay, when I came in the house, after I had seen what I saw up on the road, I came in all so excited. And Andy asked me, well, why was I so excited? I told him that the reason I was excited because I thought I just had saw Godzilla up on the road. I didn't really think that he would believe that I saw what I had seen. Then what did, what did he think about that? Well, he didn't say too much. He was standing in the kitchen fixing something for me to eat because I'd been out all evening. And I ran into the bedroom. Okay, and I changed my clothes, and I came back out sort of nervous, as I usually am, okay. lit a cigarette, and sat down. And after just a few minutes, he wanted to make sure the kids were asleep before we started talking. Then he says, well, he had something to tell me about what had happened here at the house earlier in the evening. And so I says, well, what happened? My two cats are fighting, and I walked in here, and I pulled this curtain away, and I picked up the cat, and I dropped it, and I screamed. And I looked up, and it had a human face. It turned sideways, and I only saw right here, that was the only part that was open on him. And the rest was nothing but fur, and he was big and black. And I screamed and ran into my dad in the living room. Here's some photos here, slides. Let me see if you, they look familiar to you. Judy, you can take a look at that, too. Yeah, that's what I saw in the window. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I saw on the road. That's exactly it. I saw a large black man with big eyes. To me, the eyes stood out very clearly. I could see eyes. All I know is that he was standing like this, and when he saw me and I saw him, I, look, I like took a second look, and then he made a movement, and I took off. Okay, so well, he may have turned, I don't know. Press, huh? Yeah, you want to do yeah, that? Yeah. Okay. I walk this earth down the I walk this earth and I consider it mine. I'm going tired. I'm weary now. Looking for me, don't understand. You don't know the powers that are in my hands. I've done my best to stay away from you. Now you can make me mad. The next morning, we were all up early to listen to weather reports telling of devastating blizzards careening down from the polar regions. Record low temperatures and snowfall from Atlanta to Dallas to Mount Shasta. Avalanches, mudslides, floods. The weather forecasters called this torrent of storms the Siberian Express.
Starting in Siberia, this storm moved over the ice cap through Alaska, Canada, and down into the United States and through Northern California, killing hundreds of people and animals alike. But for Ivan and the Amazing Horizon Production Company, it turned out to be, as the Indians say, a situation where the world was in agreement with our search for Bigfoot. No, never before has snow come to this lower elevation. So, I mean, years ago, remember when we trailed this thing? Mm -hmm. He'd go down to the lower elevation, and we'd never, I mean, we couldn't find his tracks. He'd get in the rocks, no oh. snow. But now, he cannot disguise or hide his tracks. There's no means there. Well, no. we know. We, well, he knows, about, oh, that's exactly right. That's the reason I have to go by myself. Because if a group comes up there, then he's going to be, I mean, he, he's uh, going to be just afraid we're going to kill him or anything like that, and he's going to get away. But any other animal, like a bear, a mountain lion, is going to get a little bit curious. And I'm hoping that this thing, I mean, we know he's curious. Oh. In other words, if I stay with him, three, four days, five days, whatever, I'm going to stay with him. And then, How I mean... How are we going to know where you are? Okay, uh, uh, how about it, Tom, Ernie, are you there? Yeah, we are, Ivan, here we are. Okay, good. Um, uh, uh, come on up and try to set up the whole expedition right near the pickup, because I'm sure I'm going to have to stay in there at least overnight this time of day, okay? Okay, Ivan, I think maybe we should uh, set up a command post down there right where we leave the race. Is that okay with you? Yes, and now, listen, I'm going to have the walkie-talkies with me, so I'll be able to uh, stay in contact with you all the time, okay? Very good. You be careful. Okay, I'm going to head out. Since 1951, when I get on the Bigfoot's trail, say in six or eight inches of snow, immediately he would drop to lower elevation, drop out of the snow, get in rocky terrain, or even maybe walk down a stream bed to lose his track. I don't think the animal ever will learn that his tracks will give him away. The Bigfoot is different, I'd say, because I believe the Bigfoot knows that you can trail him. Why don't we have more evidence of the existence of the Bigfoot creature? The question that we're most often asked. When we look at the physical makeup of this creature, he is far superior than any other living animal on this continent. He has the ability to elude us all. I myself, if I wanted to go out in the mountains with my experience, I'm sure I could disappear and never, ever be found again. Now, I think the Bigfoot is in the same category. In fact, I know he is. He is just absolutely, let's put it this way, he is elusive. You keep searching me. Searching for me. It's getting hard to hide. You keep following the tracks. That I leave behind You measure my tracks All across your lands Are you looking for me? Cause I walk like a man I've walked this earth From the dawn of time I've walked this earth Consider it mine You keep looking for me You don't understand You don't know the powers That are in my hands I walk this earth Down the time I walk this earth I consider it mine Following his tracks, Ivan came upon a spot where Bigfoot had eaten from small plants. He was obviously nearby. The only thing to do now was to build an igloo out of the snow and wait. The igloo would not only protect Ivan from the cold, but would cover up his human scent. By building the igloo with a hole in the roof and covering it with twigs, Ivan could operate his camera from inside. 
Ivan waited for hours. Suddenly, he heard a rustling in the snow. His blood ran cold as he pressed the release button of his camera. creature, curious by the sight of the igloo, began to circle around it. Frightened, Ivan felt an icy chill run down his spine until he remembered Judy Ramirez. The creature had circled her house in almost the same manner as he was doing now, and he obviously had meant no harm to her. After a few minutes, Bigfoot disappeared into the forest. Cautiously, Ivan began following the creature's tracks until he could hear crunching in the snow ahead of him. Leaving any fear of the animal behind, Ivan charged to within a few feet of the creature and with his miniature camera recorded this astounding footage. My judgment as to the value of Ivan Marx's photographs has to be divided into three categories. These are the most detailed, fine-grained pictures ever taken of a Bigfoot to date. Much can be learned from their careful analysis about the species' skull, body proportions, and genitals. I do not believe a man in a costume with bags of water hidden behind his back could shake with enough vigor to create the effect captured on this film. In my considered opinion, the third still authenticates the first two of the rapid sequence of three. In my opinion, the broad leap that the creature gives as it gets up after being shot is persuasive evidence that this is not a man in a costume. Ivan Marks reveres Bigfoot, and I am persuaded that his conditioned reflexes of the bear hunter impelled him in defense of Peggy and himself to bring it down. I share his relief that this film shows that it got up and strode off. I have compared Marx's photos and films with the skulls of all the known fossil hominids. I find the greatest similarity with Australopithecus boisei, a large man-ape established by the Leakey family as living in Africa one to two million years ago, but supposedly extinct. Its skull had a massive bony crest fore to aft, thought by some anthropologists to serve as an anchor for large jaw muscles. Presumably herbivorous, 
its canine teeth were no more prominent than our own. At first viewing, this snow sequence looks like an awkward man stumbling about in a pointy-headed, big-eared, loosely draping costume. But initial impressions become less certain upon studying it again and again. At first I felt that no creature as elusive as the Sasquatch would so carelessly knock over small trees, until I remembered that gorillas make crashing noises in the bushes by way of threatening intruders. This creature actually puts on a bluffing display, charges out toward marks, and stops abruptly. The pointy-headedness may be due to its old age or poor winter diet. Likewise, the flappy pelt. In autumn, a roly-poly bear's skin is stretched taut over accumulated fat. This creature's movements inside its loosely fitting skin may look human precisely because its proportions are very close to those of a man. I was disturbed by the absence of head movement except as its shoulders swiveled. Then I recalled the enormous folds of flesh around a male orangutan's neck that swell or shrink depending upon its mood. This creature was agitated about the strange igloo and intruder. The rigidity of its head upon its shoulders may be part of an aggressive display, a sort of swelled strut. Ivan could have made a costume and tapered around while Peggy filmed him, but would he jeopardize the credibility of the other sequences by contriving a clumsy deception? I've studied Ivan's character closely. Staging and snow scenes would be inconsistent with the intelligence, wisdom, and common sense that I have observed him to possess in such full measure. It is said that Bigfoot is afraid of his shadow. But we believe in our village, if Bigfoot can see his shadow, it is too light to walk because people with guns can see him. People must learn to leave him alone, as we do. And maybe someday he can enjoy the warm Arctic sun and learn to live with his shadow. We hope you will tell the people to the south. And if they learn this, Bigfoot will be free and our village will be happy. Rare and unique content. Please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.